That song that called The Blessing, it gets me every time. I uh, hope it was a blessing to you as you join us wherever you are, in your homes, as you're huddled together as families, as friends, tuning in to enjoy this service. We hope that God is speaking to you and blessing you right where you are. Let's pray and ask him to speak to us now. Father, it is your desire to bless your children. Even though we rebel, we don't listen, we disobey, we ignore. You're a good father and it's your desire to bless us. We're asking you now to bless us through your word. Speak to us what we need to hear. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have come to the end of our summer-long series called Did God Say That? We've looked at all kinds of different topics, topics like uh, God has a perfect plan for your life. Um, We're all God's children. Just be true to yourself or follow your heart. God won't give you more than you can handle. Christians should never judge I encourage you to go back and listen to these if you missed them. They're available for you. But we've been working our way through these common phrases, which we hear and even say in our culture, and they contain partial truths and a lot of misunderstanding. Sometimes they're flat out wrong. Today we come to a statement that I think really reflects the philosophy that's the heart of the American ideal. It's pervasive in the American church, and it's in our culture as well. It's embedded right in our own Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and, say it with me, the pursuit of happiness. There it is, the pursuit of happiness. This is a God-given right in our founding documents. Therefore, God just wants me to be happy, right? Right? God just wants me, you, us to be happy. Isn't that God's agenda? I mean, why wouldn't he? He's not against our happiness, is he? Psalm 68, verse 3, But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Why wouldn't God want us to be happy? What's God got against happiness? Why wouldn't he want that? Or perhaps in the more contemporary theological song called Happy, clap along with me, if you feel like a room without a roof. <laughs> clap, come along and clap along with me if you feel like happiness is the truth. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. I don't know what any of that means, but we sing it all the time. There's a kind of theology of happiness that is, we don't say it this way, but I really believe it exists in many of our minds and the way that we operate and certainly in our culture today. Let me walk you through four sort of sequential steps in this theology of happiness in the American culture. Number one, we already said, God wants me to be happy. Well, if God wants me to be happy, then naturally, whatever makes me happy must be right because that's what God wants. If God wants me to be happy, Whatever makes me happy must be right. Number two, number three, whatever makes me unhappy must be wrong because that can't be what God wants. And number four, any discomfort, disappointment, or delay cannot be God's will for me. Now, we wouldn't say this out loud, but we, many, many people, even inside the church in America, live as if this is the code. This is their theological framework. Here's the challenge. What happens to your understanding of God and what God is like If your theological filter, and theology just means the study of God, the understanding of God, is your own happiness. If your happiness is the way that you understand God, then how do you, what happens to your view of God as you go through life? And how do you even measure happiness? What does that mean? You know, think about your life for a minute, or just life in general. We come into this world through a painful process called childbirth. Certainly painful for the mother and for the baby. Most babies come in screaming, crying. Of course, there's a lot of cooing and giggling, and some babies, we call them happy babies. Some are colicky babies, but there's some joy and happiness in infancy and childhood. But there's a lot of crying and tears, too. Certainly, every parent knows that. Then we grow up, kind of, and we get better at managing our emotions, sometimes. And we learn to rationalize our unmet expectations in life, usually. But life is still hard, and there's still tears. As little kids, we think being teenagers will be awesome. And then as teenagers, we think being adults and having freedom will be great. Then we become adults, and we realize how good we had it as little kids. And then we grow old, and things start to break down, fall apart, and we die. (laughs) Job 14.1 says, 
as man, as sparks fly upward, so are we people, men born for trouble. Or to quote the man in black from the great movie, The Princess Bride, life is pain, highness. Anyone who tells you differently is selling something. Now, if we're lucky, if we're the fortunate ones, somewhere in the midst of all this pain and struggle of life, we take walks on the beach with somebody we love. We watch sunrises and sunsets. We enjoy the kids playing in the yard. We laugh with friends around a table with good food or a fire. We listen to grandma sing an old hymn that she loves. We smell fresh baked cookies. We eat fresh baked cookies. We hold hands with someone we love. We cuddle a newborn in our arms. We listen to Handel's Messiah. We watch snow fall on a quiet winter morning, and we experience a thousand other simple pleasures. But is that it? Is that happiness? Is that really what makes life worth living? What happens when you don't get enough of those things? What happens if you don't get any of those things? How do you measure happiness if you're born in a part of the world where none of that happens for you? Where life is all pain or you die young? Sometimes the hurt isn't any one thing we can put our finger on. It's just there, kind of looming in the background like a shadow. Let's be honest. If God's highest priority for us is our happiness, then he's not very good at his job, is he? If God's goal and agenda is your personal happiness and mine and ours, then he's not doing it very well. I mean, I don't have to tell all of you. We all know there's a lot of unhappiness and pain and injustice and struggle in the world right now. It's always been true. We feel it acutely right now. Now, God is not opposed to your happiness. He's not the cosmic killjoy. He's not out to make people miserable. But it's not his highest priority for your life. God's highest priority for your life is not your happiness. It is so much higher than that. Let me say that again. God's highest priority for your life is not your own happiness. It is much higher much greater, much higher than that. God's agenda for you is greater than your agenda for you. Let me give you an illustration about this. When my son my old, wrestled, I was you know, a wrestling parent, and wrestling parents, all sports parents in general can be uh, not so great, uh, but wrestling parents can be hyper competitive, and I certainly was one of those at times. And I wanted my son to win, of course. I wanted him to wrestle well, of course. And when he won, I was excited, and he was excited. And I was happy, and he was happy. But if in his joy of victory, he walks over and mocks his opponent and gives the opposing coach the the middle finger, suddenly my highest priority for him is not his victory anymore. It's his character. God has something greater in store for us than our experience of happiness in this life. Let me give you a couple examples of when God does not want you happy. God does not want you happy if it means doing something sinful or stupid. (laughs) God does not want you happy if happiness, by your definition, means disobeying him or making destructive choices. Yes, God made us with a capacity and desire for happiness. He gave you unique passions and personality and interests, but that does not mean that every one of your passions can be trusted or will lead you in the right direction. That does not mean that every desire we experience is good for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Peter writing to, the, to the, these Christians, and he calls them little children. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, also be holy in all your conduct. Your former passions of your, 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 passions of your former ignorance, those aren't good for you. Those actually won't produce your happiness. You, you, you once thought so, but now you know better, he's saying. God is far more concerned about your pursuit of holiness than your pursuit of happiness. To pursue something means to aim your life at it, to point yourself and to move in a particular direction. That's what it means to pursue, to go after. And if you're pursuing one thing, that by definition will necessarily mean you're not pursuing other things. This is really important for us to get. Do not be conformed to your former passions. Second reason God does not want you happy. God does not want you happy if it's only based on this world. 
He doesn't want you happy if it means doing sinful or stupid things. He doesn't want you, quote unquote, happy if it's only based on this world. One of Satan's greatest schemes, I believe, is to keep our eyes focused downward, to looking only at the here and now, in this t- present moment, in this life, for our fulfillment and joy and happiness. Never letting us realize that there's something beyond this life, that there's something much, much greater in store for us. John, in his first letter, first of three, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with all of its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. If you're fixated on your life right now, your present circumstances, it's like trying to hold water in your hands. It just runs out through your fingers. You you can't hold it. You can't find it. You can't retain it. And so many of us say we believe in God and believe that that Jesus is the Son of God and and say we want to follow him, but we're focused on our experience of happiness here and now, in the present moment, in this life. And if that's all it is, God is saying you're missing it. In his essay, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis writes about this. One of my, I, I know I quote Lewis a lot. It's kind of a running joke around here. But he says so many things so profoundly. And this essay, The Weight of Glory, W-E-I-G-H-T, uh, is so profound. And here's what he writes. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. He's so right. There's so much more being offered to us. That image of an ignorant child playing in the mud with having no idea what's being offered. Dr. Lori Santos is a psychology professor at Yale University. She teaches a class called The Art of Happiness. It's one of the most popular classes at Yale. And then she has a podcast called The Happiness Lab Podcast. I listened to a couple episodes in preparation for this sermon. Uh, and really, she has managed to reduce happiness to podcast-length episodes of life hacks. Is that it? Really? That's what happiness amounts to? A bunch of life hacks? Not from God's perspective. Because you're aiming in the wrong place. Thomas Aquinas wrote, It is impossible for any created good to constitute man's happiness. For happiness is that perfect good which entirely satisfies one's desire. Otherwise, it would not be the ultimate end if something yet remained to be desired. Here's what he's saying. Happiness, it's, it cannot be fully realized in created things because there's something beyond them that we're made for. Here's the primary point. And if you get nothing else, write this one down. <laughs> Happiness is actually the byproduct of pursuing something else with your life. Happiness is not the goal or the aim or the purpose. It's a byproduct of pursuing something else. You cannot find happiness, ultimately speaking, by making it the focus or the primary pursuit of your life. In fact, in my experience, both as a pastor and as a human, those people who make their personal happiness the primary focus or pursuit of their life, they almost invariably find themselves on a path toward misery and emptiness. Here's how Jesus puts it in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We don't find happiness by aiming our lives at it. We find it by aiming at something else. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Is it possible that in our pursuit of the American dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and in and of themselves, those aren't wrong things, but is it possible that if those become our gods, We actually miss God? We actually miss what he has for us? 
which is even greater? To quote C.S. Lewis again in an essay, lesser known essay called First and Second Things. He says, you cannot get second things by putting them first. You can get second things only by putting first things first. Put first things first, and you get second things thrown in. Put second things first, and you lose both first and second things. Now you might have to go back and reread that one. Here's what he's saying. It's, he calls it the principle of first things. It's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 6. If you aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. If you aim at earth, you miss out on both. This is profoundly true. Well, what are second things? Remember that list I gave a minute ago? Walks on the beach, watching your kids play, listening to a beautiful hymn, all the little pleasures of life. They're not wrong. They're good. They're God's gifts to us, but they're not first things. Accumulating wealth, being successful in a career, watching your kids grow up happy. These are not wrong. They're good things. God gives these gifts to us, but they're not first things. His kingdom, his righteousness. God does not want us to pursue happiness, friends. He wants us to pursue him. There it is. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of God. And he's pursuing you with his grace. This is what it comes down to. God doesn't want you to pursue happiness with your life. He made you to pursue him, to know a relationship with him, and then find true joy and true happiness. Lewis goes on in the same essay. He writes, Every preference of a small good to a greater good or a partial good to a total good inevitably involves the loss of both. Apparently, the universe is made this way. He says, The woman who makes her dog the center of her whole life loses in the end not only her dignity and usefulness as a human, but even the proper pleasure of dog keeping. He's right. And so many of us are chasing after second things. We say we believe in God, but our life is aimed at the pursuit of second things. No wonder there's so much misery and angst and unrest. God does not want us to pursue happiness, but to pursue him. And in him then, all of the lesser, what Lewis calls second things, find their proper place and their proper enjoyment in our lives and we find out there's so much more for us. Now, in the Bible, the concept of happiness and joy and blessing are really interconnected. They're, they overlap. They're not quite synonyms, but they're very connected. In our culture, you, you, it's no, you see hashtag blessed all the time, right? What does that usually mean if somebody says hashtag blessed? Blessed to what? Blessed to experience this. To, it usually means something really good has happened in their life. So they put hashtag blessed and a picture of whatever it is. Or, or I, I don't use this one, but apparently my, my kid's generation, only good vibes, right? Only good vibes, good vibes only. What does that mean? Only things that make us feel happy and positive. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, gives us an astounding list of the blessed life in God's kingdom. Let me read it for us. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12 sometimes referred to as the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, what? And be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Just read through that list again merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. Our nation needs more of those. That's who we're called to be. But just think about that list for a minute. Poor in spirit, meek, mourn, hungry and thirsty, peacemakers, persecuted. These are not the qualities you usually see on a list of you know, good vibes only or the hashtag blessed life. Not quite. Not at all. In fact, the Greek word for blessed is the, Greek, is the word makarios. 
And makarios literally can be translated fortunate, happy, or blessed. It, it's an accurate translation to call this happy, makarios. Jesus is giving us a descriptive list of what happiness really is for the Christ follower. As a matter of fact, let's read this list again, and this time substitute the word happy for the word blessed. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Happy are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice, be happy, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Does that describe you? Does it describe me? Friends, the blessed life, the happy life that God is calling us to does not mean a pain-free life. We already know that. It does not mean you're immune from struggle or difficulty or challenge. You know that. It does not mean you'll never experience disappointment or delay or heartache. Here's what it means. It means if you're in Christ, if you know Jesus, you will not spend one day, not one moment alone. You will never be without him. He will never leave you nor forsake you. It means no matter what happens in your life, no matter what heartache or joy comes, there is an undercurrent of blessing, of knowing that God loves you and has good things in store for you ultimately that can never be taken away. You'll never be abandoned. You'll never be without hope. You can know that your past is redeemed, your present can make sense, and your future can be secure because of Christ. That's the pursuit. That's true happiness, blessing, and joy. That's what God wants for you. And a moment ago, I said God doesn't want you to pursue happiness. He wants you to pursue him. Do you know that he's pursuing you? Do you know the real beauty of the gospel? is not that we chase after God. We actually don't because of our sinfulness and our brokenness and our rebellion. But he chases after us. He comes after us. That's the whole message of the gospel. Not that we're climbing a spiritual ladder trying to measure up and be good enough for God, that somehow we make it there by our, our good effort and our good record. The gospel is that God comes to us in Christ. He comes, God, Emmanuel, with us, comes down, enters into the brokenness, the unhappiness, misery, and, and, and oppression and injustice of this world. He experiences all that. He takes all that on himself. Why? So that you could know the blessing and joy and true happiness of being in relationship with him. Some of you that are watching right now, right where you are, you believe intellectually in God, but you don't know this happiness and this joy. And you're longing for it. And he wants to give it to you. I'm going to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you have not called us to pursue our own happiness. For that is the path to selfishness and misery. And many of us are on it. But you've come into our world. And you've taken our place. You've absorbed our sin and pain and suffering in yourself, Lord Jesus, so that we might have relationship with the Father through you. So for anyone watching right now who doesn't know that, God, would you speak words of grace to their heart? Right now, would they cry out to you, acknowledging their need, recognizing that they're on the wrong path, turning around and running into your arms? and that they would know by your spirit that you welcome them, that you forgive them, that you receive them, and that you bless them. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. Amen.